Mother's Day to all our mothers here today. We honor you, and if you're here this morning or you're watching it online or our brand new YouTube channel, uh, man, happy Mother's Day. We are so honored that you are here today. For those of you who are just walking in, you're like, I didn't think I was that late. Like, you're already preaching. Like, I'm sorry. It's like we moved everything earlier if you didn't catch that for a reason, and hopefully that reason will become more apparent. We're now in week two of our series, Follow, and we started last week describing what is it that a follower of Jesus looks like. And we started last week by saying there's actually a word in Scripture that is used, and it's not Christian that describes followers of Jesus. And we said that word is, for those of you who heard last week or watched it online, disciple, thank you. That is so affirming that you remember a word of what I said last week. And that's frankly why we did one word, because I'm like, I don't know if anybody remember anything else more than one word, but that is the word disciple, because that incorporates so much of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that I am just doing what Jesus does. And so we want to expand that a little bit today, and on Mother's Day, talk about worship. Now, I grew up with a phenomenal mother, and she is still alive and still appreciate all the work that she has done in my life. In fact, I am convinced one of the reasons that I stand here and talk about the truth of God in Jesus Christ is because my mom spent so many times um, on her knees praying for me and encouraging me and sharing with me the faith. And my grandmother was the same kind of woman that my mom is and was when I was growing up. And I can remember times as a kid growing up and I'd talk about my grandmother. And I'm like, Mom, isn't she phenomenal? I don't think I could convict her of a sin. Like, I never see her doing anything wrong. She's always friendly to people. She loves everybody. She's encouraging all the time. And my mom would look at me and like, that's not the same woman who raised me. That's <laughs> So I don't know what kind of mom you had growing up. I realize not everybody had a mom like I did, and some people have broken wounds from their childhood growing up because of some wounds that their mom carried for many of years. Some of your moms aren't even alive anymore, and so there's a longing on Mother's Day that I really miss my mom. And, and some people, like I heard um, a gentleman this week, he said, man, when I was growing up, um, and I had a big problem with my mom. In fact, I had a drug problem when I was growing up. I got drugged to church, I got drugged to Sunday school, I got drugged to vacation Bible school. That's what my mom did for me. And my mom did a lot of those same kind of things too. And, and frankly, if you're here this morning, because I know there's a number of you, please do not raise your hand that are only here today because it's Mother's Day. And frankly, that's the one thing that mom wanted today, your spouse wanted today, is I want everybody together to go to church with me today. That's all I want for Mother's Day. And I just want to thank you for being here today. Hopefully this message will be for you. Because frankly, what I want to do is help everybody. All of us need to do this is to make a shift from this idea that we show up and we go to church to describe what it means to be a follower of Jesus, which means to move from going to church to going to worship. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I realize as I mentioned the word worship, that all kinds of things get conjured up in your mind. And so everybody all of a sudden gets nervous and you're wondering like, well, what does worship really mean? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And the question that's going to revolve around this is simply this. What kind of worship does God prefer? What kind of worship does God most prefer? And I know what you're thinking already. Because what you're thinking is what you grew up with. Because some of you grew up in a very maybe quiet, contemplative, sort of holy, reverent kind of style where the preacher wore robes. Um, I have robes. I wear them at 8 o'clock. So you might be familiar with that kind of style, like, oh, singing the old hymns. That's what I think God most prefers because that's what you grew up with. And some of you, this is your only experience of what worship is like. You're like, robes, why would you wear a dress in front of people? I don't really understand that or the tradition behind that. I don't get like singing the old hymns. I don't understand them. I don't know how they go in the stanzas. I don't get it. And some of you are thinking, this is the only worship experience I know. So this must be what God prefers. Some of you come from other backgrounds and you have different traditions. And so I say all that to say this, that at least in our mind, if we can be honest, it's our tradition that frankly usually answers that question for us. And so I just want us to be honest with that today because all of us come with our preconceived notion of what does God most 
prefer, and it's usually the style that I like. And I want to show you that by showing you a picture, because you can look at a picture like this and go, yeah, nothing's abnormal about that at all. (laughs) That's what Cowboy fans do when they're in Tampa, evidently, at a football game on Football Sunday, is, man, we are getting painted up, we are getting dressed up, and we are worshiping the Dallas Cowboys on Sunday. We look at that like that's completely normal. Like we wouldn't look at that and go, eh, that's a little unusual at all. But now you go to the next picture and you look at that and you're like, and some of you are thinking, wow, that, that's holy. Like, look at that. That's beautiful. And some of you are thinking, ooh, I don't know. Those hands are above the shoulders. That's, <laughs> that's a little weird, a little bit uncomfortable. I'm not sure. I think she should lower those a little bit, maybe put her head down, not maybe draw so much attention to her. So, I'm not sh- and so it really depends. But I, I noticed one thing this morning is that nobody um, has any um, face outside of makeup, any face paint on this morning. Nobody dressed themselves like in God colors, uh, ready to come into worship. There was no tailgating going on in the parking lot. Uh, I checked because I was hungry, and there was no barbecues going on out there this morning. And, and we wonder why. Like, you take it outside in the context of a football game, and that's completely normal. But you get into worship, you're like, oh, no, you can't do that. That's not right. And so what I want to do this morning is um, talk about one simple word this morning, and the word is praise. Because that's really what it means to worship, is to praise the name of Jesus, to lift up the name of Jesus. What's, that's what that means. And, and about 500 years ago, there was a reformer in the church, and his name was Martin Luther. Some of you are familiar with him. He's the one that nailed the 95 Theses on the Castle Church in Wittenberg, and that started this whole reformation of the church. And Martin Luther, not only did he reform the church and have all kinds of writings and teachings on the church, he also wrote a ton of of music. And some of you, even if you never grew up in a traditional church, are probably familiar with some of his songs. Probably the most popular one is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. You might have heard that tune before. And some people talk about like, oh yeah, he ripped that off of a bar tune. That was like a tavern tune back in his day because he used to like to go to taverns and drink beer and wine. And frankly, if you know that song, it does sound, sound like a drinking tune, doesn't it? Like, da da na 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 Hey! da na 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 Thank you. But it actually wasn't ripped off of a tune like that. But Martin Luther, as he wrote those tunes, he had in mind the culture that he was speaking to. And I've got a quote, and I didn't print it up there because I just wanted you to hear it. I didn't want you to read it. I just want you to hear what Martin Luther said about music. Therefore, I too, with the help of others, have brought together some sacred songs in order to make a good beginning and give an incentive to those who can better carry on the gospel and bring it to the people. And these songs were arranged in four parts for no other reason than that I wanted to attract the youth who should and must be trained in music and other fine arts away from the love songs and carnal pieces and give them something wholesome to learn instead. And so he took the music of the day and put new music and new words to it to give um, young people something to grab a hold of. And you know what? In that day, that was radical. And you know what we call that today? Oh, that's sacred. (laughs) Nobody was calling it sacred back then. They're like, hey, wait a minute. That sounds a little bit too familiar. That's too modern. You could hear that on the top 40 charts of the day. That's not what we do. But Martin Luther understood something about praise. And frankly, this sermon is not about Martin Luther. It's not even about my preference on worship. This is about what God has to say about worship. And so um, we have one word for praise. It's praise. In Hebrew, there are seven different words that we um, translate into the word praise. And I thought it would be fun to sort of take these very quickly. I know some of you are like, oh, please, that's going to be the most boring thing on the face here. Just, I'm going to go quickly through these. They're on your outline, or if you're using the version app, they're all printed for you right there. I just want to dive into a few of these. The first one, halal. That's to rave, to boast, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish is what that means. And so the scene that I get in my mind is Palm Sunday. And if you grew up in church, you've heard that. We just celebrated that a few weeks ago where Jesus rides in 
to Jerusalem on the donkey. And people, Luke records in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 19, because um, people had been talking about the miracles that Jesus performed, that they were just talking and shouting about everything that they had seen and heard in such a way they're hallelujah the name of Jesus. They're raving and boasting about all they had seen God do. And so a lot of the church leaders like, tell these people to be quiet. Disciples, you got to tell them to be quiet. We don't want to cause any trouble here. You're stirring up the people. They can't hallel Jesus as he walks in to Jerusalem. Well, this is what God describes in Psalm 35. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. Among the throngs, I will hallel you. I will praise you. I will rave about you, God. That's the kind of worship that God prefers. Now, if you grew up like me, I was a very traditional German Lutheran, old Lutheran hymnal, page 5 and 15, and when we're really crazy on crazy Sundays, we'd open up page 32. Ooh. <laughs> and so that's what I grew up with, and what I also grew up with was, shh, shh, anybody else in the church, that's what you grew up with, and yeah, the, cool, I just be quiet, sit still, don't say anything. Well, that's not Hallel. Hallel's I'm going to boast, I'm going to rave about how great my God is. That's Hallel. Yada, that's the next one. That's worship with extended hands. Literally to throw your hands up. This is also the universal sign for I surrender. Man, I give up. And I find it very interesting that a lot of people um, are offended when people raise their hands in worship. I think this is a beautiful aspect of worship because what are we saying? God, I surrender to you. It's not about me and my preferences and my desires. It's not about my life. It is about you. My life is all about you, Jesus. And so I raise my hands up to the heavens. I yada you, O oh Lord. That's what I want to do because I want the world to know that I surrender to you, not just in Sunday morning, but every day of the week. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 30, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will yada you forever. I will surrender my heart to you forever. Yada. Barak is the next one, and that is to bless or to kneel, to bow as an act of adoration. And, and I like this because I grew up in an old uh, church with the pews, and, and they had the kneelers. Anybody else remember the old kneelers? And you'd open the kneelers at a certain part of the service and ka-chunk on the floor, and everybody would get down on their knees, and we'd typically do that for confession or prayer time if you were able to kneel. This isn't talking about just kneeling for the sake of kneeling. This is an act of, of adoration. And I just bow down to you, O oh God. Praise the Lord, the psalmist writes. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Barak, his holy name. So notice, this isn't just about kneeling as a physical act of worship. This is about my inmost being. What's going on inside of me? God, that I hold your name so holy that there is a reverence when we sing about your name and we call upon your name that I am barocking. I am kneeling down as an act of adoration. Zamer is the next one, which literally means to pluck the strings of an instrument with joyful expression. This isn't just playing for the sake of playing with a plain old look on your face. And that's why I'm glad that when we play music in here, you can see, and Jet gives the example of that all the time. He's got a smile on his face. He is energetic. He is passionate about playing music. That's what Zamar uh, incorporates. That's what it's supposed to be like. Um, there are a lot of things. Being Mother's Day, I can tell stories about my mom and grandmothers and other women um, in my life. My grandmother was, again, just a saint of a woman, and she taught me three things that I really remember about worship. Number one is you should get there early to prepare, that you can't just walk in and be ready to praise God, that you should come in and pray and read scriptures and just get your heart ready so when you start singing, man, your heart is ready to start worshiping God. That was number one. Number two, she always told me, never leave before the blessing, and she used to pain her heart. I could see it in 
her eyes. She goes, I don't know why people leave a service before the blessing. Why would you want to leave before receiving a blessing from God? And this wasn't a guilt thing for my grandmother. She just physically couldn't understand how people could walk out without receiving something like that from God. And then the third thing she always said, when you walk away from communion, um, remember what you have just received because you should be dancing coming back from communion. That man, that God has poured out his lifeblood in me and I have tasted and seen the physical presence of God. And she goes, I don't understand why people look like their dog just died when they come back from communion. It's like, man, do you not know what you just partook of? This is the most joyous occasion ever. And she goes, I never could have understood why people worship that way too. We should be doing zamar. That's what we should be doing. It is good, the psalmist writes, to yada, to praise the Lord and to zamar, make music to your name, O most high. Shavak is the next one, to shout, to address in a loud tone. Again, that's sort of different than, than the whole idea of being shh and being quiet. No, I'm going to shout and do that. I don't care if I can't sing really well. That's all right because I'm going to shavak. I'm going to shout and address what is going on inside of my soul. I don't care if you're singing out of tune. That's why we have speaker systems and you hear a lot more of that than we hear individual singers going on. I don't care if you can only carry a tune in a bucket or if you only play the radio. Um, our job is to shavak. It's not just those who are gifted to shavak. We all should be shouting and addressing as the psalmist writes, because your love is better than life, my lips will Barak you, and I will shavak you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Toda is the next one, which is to lift um, hands in adoration, and it's often used with a sacrifice, that you're offering a sacrifice, and so you see it a lot in the book of Leviticus, that it's not just coming and offering a sacrifice to God, but doing so with thanksgiving. When I had an opportunity to go to Africa and got a chance to lead worship, well not lead worship, but to preach there and experience worship, I should say, they got to a point in the service and they're all up and singing and dancing and coming down the aisle and then it dawned on me what they were doing. They were giving an offering. They were putting coins and bills into the offering basket up in front and they was about the most joyful I've ever seen people in my life and I remember asking um, the person who was leading worship, I'm like, tell me more about that. How come you give offering like that? That's not the way we do that in America. We very neatly pass things down a row and, and that's what we do and he said, oh, these people are so excited because they can give back to God something. <laughs> and they're so excited to be able to offer God something, to toda something to God, to give it back to Him. And so the psalmist writes, I will halal, I'll praise God's name in song, and I will glorify Him with toda, with thanksgiving, with my offering, and offer Him everything that I have. This last one you'll probably remember just for the name of it. It's tehillah, because it sounds a lot like Tequila, yeah. You're like, are we allowed to say that in church? I'm not really sure if that's really appropriate for that. But you'll remember this one. I'll guarantee you that. And it really sort of has the same effect because it is exuberant singing. <laughs> it just sort of comes out of you. That's sort of what tequila does in the Hebrew word for this. Psalm 34, verse 1. I will barak extol the name of the Lord at all times. His tequila will always be on my lips. And it is funny. You can laugh at that. That is pretty funny. That's why I picked that one. I thought that was pretty cool. But this is sort of like, you know, when you're at a ball game and your team wins and they play your college fight song, man, everybody is, is singing. Everybody is healing that song. Or when it's the 4th of July and they play the national anthem and you just sort of feel the energy of that. And so Tehillah just comes out of you. You can't help but to keep that. And that's exactly what praise is described this way. You see, here's really what I want you to know about worship. Worship is frankly just a response to what you value the most. That's really all worship is. Because you're going to worship something. Everybody worships something. You can worship the cowboys. You can worship your job. You can worship your car. You can worship your spouse. You can worship all kinds of things. 
But worship is really a response to what we value the most. What are we doing these words? What are we hallelujahing? What are we yadahing? What are we barakking? What is samaring? What is shavaking? What is we todahing? What is telhelying? What are we doing? What is getting our worship? You see, the early followers of Jesus understood this. And they knew that there was nothing more valuable than their relationship with Jesus. There was nothing of greater value in their life than Jesus. And so that's where their worship came out of that experience of, there's nothing I have more valuable than Jesus. Because they understood that we are broken and separated from God and that God became a man and came in the flesh as Jesus and he lived a perfect life and he gave up that life and he died a horrible death on a cross that we would never have to face the wrath of God, that we would never have to worry about the anger of God being poured out on us, that we might be forgiven. And then he rose again after they saw him be buried in a tomb, rose to life again and appeared to them with peace be with you and go and tell this message of hope and life to the world. And so this is what they valued more than anything. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to worship God because Jesus is what we value the most. Worship, frankly, is also love expressed. Worship is love expressed. See, you can say, I love God, but if there's nothing coming out of you, do you really love God? I mean, I can't imagine you loving your spouse that way of of never expressing it, never doing anything that would say to them or to anybody else, you love this person. See, love has to be expressed in order to be love. That's how God first loved us, that he gave us Jesus. It's love expressed. And so worship is simply just love expressed to God. My grandmother, again, um, saint of a woman, and I, I can remember when she had a stroke and late in her life she had really lost her, her eyesight and she had memorized the hymnal. She could tell you whatever, you name a hymn number, she could tell you how many stanzas and chances are she had it all from memory. And so when she lost her sight and they were beginning to bring some more praise songs, more contemporary music into the church and, and she was there and I remember sitting next to her and she didn't know the words because she couldn't see them anymore and uh, Um, But looking at her face and seeing how she worshipped, it didn't matter if she knew the words or not, or the tune or not. She just loved worshipping Jesus. And I remember, I want to be more like this woman in my life. And when she would hear people complaining uh, about, like, oh, I like my old hymns, I like it that way. And she goes, I like worshipping Jesus. And frankly, I don't like you talking about our worship leaders and our pastors the way you are. Uh, If you got an issue, you need to go talk to them. And she was just that kind of, she just loved Jesus. We, every time we'd have some kind of meal at our house, we never know who was going to show up that day because inevitably, like the, the postman, his wife passed away and so she invited him so he didn't have to be alone on a holiday and so we never knew who was showing up. She just loved everybody that way. Worship is just love expressed. And so let me share this story with you from the Bible. It comes from Exodus and Moses, God says, we're going to have a worship experience and I want you to prepare for this for two days. And so two days, they're getting ready to worship, and here's what happens. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, and everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Wow. Would you like to be there? (laughs) I mean, wouldn't that be an awesome worship experience? Like, that's one you talk about from from ever and ever. And that need, you show up and you go home. How was worship today? Oh, you're not going to believe what happened. Mountains were trembling and smoke, and God was being trumpets blowing. I imagine what didn't happen that day. I don't imagine there was a lot of people walking away going, you know what? That was a little too showy for me. <laughs> you know, the whole shaking of the mountains thing, that was just a little bit over the t- Too smoky, too. I couldn't really see anything. I didn't like the smoke thing. And, and the trumpets were just way too loud. I couldn't stand the trumpets. No, nobody was saying that. Why? Because they were in the presence of a holy God, and they were all worshiping God. They were all praising God together. So what style of worship does God most prefer? 
And to be honest, this is tough for me because I like what I grew up with too. But I tell you, God has changed my heart over the years, and I, I define myself this way. I'm an eclectic worshiper. I just like to worship God. I could care what less form it takes. It doesn't matter to me. I can put on a robe and worship God with hymns. Um, we can play music like this. I'm all over that and, and have hymns. In Africa, I didn't understand a word they were singing, but man, I'm all over that worship experience. That was incredible. If somebody told me that, you know what? Hey, in Mansfield, Texas, we love kazoos, and we think if we had a kazoo service... That would bring people to Jesus. You know what? I hate kazoos, but I will lead a kazoo service if I thought people were going to come in Jesus. I just like to be around people that love Jesus and want to worship Jesus. That's what followers of Jesus do. That's the heartbeat of people who love Jesus. You can have a personal preference. That's fine. But don't mistake what kind of worship that God desires and God wants, that God prefers. We'll let Jesus have the last word. Here's the last word of Jesus. Um, we heard this just a few moments ago as Jesus is talking to this woman at the well. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And may God just change our hearts today as we follow him, that we would worship him in a new way. And, and because um, we changed our service a little bit. There was the intentionality behind this. Um, I thought, I didn't just want to preach and then say, okay, well, great, pray and go home. I wanted to practice what we preach, if that's okay. I wanted to now let um, all of that praise come out of our lips. And so we're going to invite the worship team um, to come forward. I'm going to pray, and we are going to worship, if that's okay with you, because I think that's important to do. Let's practice what we've just talked about. God, our Heavenly Father, how great is your name in all of the earth, and we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so would you come and open up our hearts, our minds, our souls, so that every fiber of our being can worship you now. Lord, you are holy, and so come and be holy in this moment, and come down and speak to us, transform us, make us more and more like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.